this, okay. Hi, <laughs> my name's Becky and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. So this is actually my fourth time, I think, to share my story and I thought for sure it would get easier. <laughs> it just doesn't, but that's okay. Oh well, all right, my story is one of a very normal basic sinner who was saved by an incredibly big and generous and gracious God. And I have fairly fond memories of growing up. I was the youngest of three girls. Um, my sisters were in some of the pictures. They enjoyed torturing me and making fun of me, um, but I also felt fiercely protected by them. One day when I was seven years old, enjoying a very happy middle-class uh, existence, I came home on the school bus and I noticed a strange car in my driveway. Not only that, but when I went inside, my father was there in the house with a woman I did not know. He explained that she had driven him home. My dad was going blind by that point. I think I also had a picture of him when he was totally blind. And um, he walked her outside and thinking I wasn't watching, gave her a big long kiss. Now, there were a couple problems with what I had just seen. Number one, my dad was still very much married to my mother. <laughs> Um, number two, my dad had been my hero before this. I was very disappointed, and as a seven-year-old, didn't really know what to do with that, but somehow knew this was probably a secret. And uh, number three, my father was a minister. Uh, and even a seven-year-old knows that's probably not what a minister is supposed to be doing. Um, that day fractured some parts of me and God's still working on rebuilding those. I later, um, one of the first speaker meetings I heard was someone that shared some things that alcoholics all have in common. And one is that at a very young age, they were aware that the adults in the world were not gonna be taking care of them. And I, that really resonated with me. I was like, oh yeah, I've had that for a long time. Um, my parent, in my teenage years, my mother would eventually find out um, that there were at least three other women. We're not really sure we know the total of that. Um, she filed for divorce, they got separated, um, but eventually reunited. If not happily, then at least resolved to sort of take care of each other. And we never really talked about that day, as I said, because that's kind of what my family did. Um, but some giant wounds formed in my heart. One, like I said, was the adults are not okay, and I was gonna need to take care of myself. Two, even if things looked okay, something was probably going on underneath that was not good, and it could pop up at any time. And three, people cannot be trusted like you think. They, they're not really who you think they are, so keep your guard up. Uh, it would take years before I'd recognize these lies and let God repair them. The good news is that in my childhood, I think this brought on sort of a hunger for God, and I was involved in church, so I think that brokenness um, was a good thing. I was baptized, and, um, or I guess I reaffirmed my baptism, as we do, as Methodists did, and confirmed, um, and I really felt God's hand on me many times, so even I can look back now and see a lot of times he was reaching out to me. Um, my hometown, Frankfurt, was just 45 minutes from Asbury Seminary, and so I had really good youth pastors. I can't say enough about a good youth ministry. Um, and they really mentored me in my Christian walk and got me involved in the Bible, I think at 11 or 12 years old. I then went to college at the University of Kentucky, and eventually met my husband, Wes. After we got married, I was very happy. Um, and at the same time, there was something nagging at my soul that I just couldn't quite put my uh, finger on. About a month into our marriage, um, Dr. Foley, who was Taylor Foley's father, uh, saw Wes for a routine physical and determined that he had aortic valve disease. We went on to see a specialist and that specialist um, told us that at 21 I would probably be a widow um, or at best I'd be married to a disabled man. That's a whole another story that <laughs> Wes can tell. That's not what happened. But to think that at 21 is a little bit shocking. Um, this was the second time in my life that it felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. That fall, I began having anxiety and panic attacks. 
and nearly drove myself to the ER numerous times. Um, so the interesting thing, though, about that is this is 1993. No one actually spoke about anxiety. And um, I thought for the longest time that I was actually going crazy. And um, if anyone found out, they would never speak to me. It was kind of like this giant secret. And um, eventually, I'm thankful for how common it is. I have at least one kid, I teach high school, and I have at least one kid a day say, I'm just so anxious. And I thought, oh, how great that they can just come talk about that. Um, but <laughs> I had no idea. It was like, I don't know, my head's spinning and all kinds of stuff. So I um, did start to see a counselor then, and he started to unpack some of what was going on. So we got a little relief. Um, but soon after that, we moved to Fort Lauderdale, so Kentucky to Fort Lauderdale. And I was able to attend graduate school. I got a degree um, in marriage and family therapy. And most schools at that point recommend if you're in a counseling program that you get some counseling. Because <laughs> you're going to be, you know, before you help others. Um, I'm kind of fascinated with how surface level I somehow kept that. You know, I'm like, wow, I really, now looking back, really didn't do a lot of work there. Because uh, I think I was still kind of in my own delusion that I was, Hey, things were pretty good. Things are great. Um, let's see, where am I? Okay, so then once I graduated, we moved back to Kentucky, and we had our son Caleb, who was in the videos, and we adore him. Um, at the age of 30, I remember thinking things really couldn't get any better. He was three, he was very cute. Um, and I was pregnant with our second child, and we had a new church we were excited about. We really felt like God was moving in there. And I was unaware I was about to go through kind of the third, like, sucker punch, or at least that's what it felt like. So while Wes was away, um, an armed man broke into our home and attempted to attack me. Um, when I looked into his eyes, I just heard a voice in my head say, evil. And I now believe this was a warning from the Holy Spirit. Um, who was ever present. I was able to grab our son Caleb and, I guess, in that motion, knock the guy off and run to a neighbor's house. Um, but he chased us with a gun. And my son somehow still remembers that. Um, and, but thankfully, the neighbors got us. So he was later convicted of being a serial rapist. And I was glad to identify him and be a part of putting him away. Um, and I was just so grateful to have escaped the attack. And I think that was just the story I decided to go with. <laughs> like, I'm just moving on. I'm so grateful. Thanks. God was with me. Um, and a lot of people kept wanting to hear about it, and so that's kind of just, that was the story. Um, I was not willing to admit to myself or anyone else the wounds that it left on my heart. It reaffirmed the lie that even if things feel okay, I'm not really safe. Um, unfortunately, things got worse. At my ultrasound for our son that I was pregnant with, the doctor appeared to tell me that a key bone was missing in his skull, and though we could see his heart beating on the screen, um, his body was inconsistent with life, and he would never be able to live outside the womb. Um, shock settled in, and when I gave birth to him at 6 a.m. one dismal November morning, my heart really shattered into a thousand pieces. It was like a part of me had actually died, but I was expected to keep being here. And um, that felt really hard to figure out. Nothing in life could have really prepared me for that level of brokenness. I don't think I knew that your heart could hurt that much. And um, I'm sure other people know what I'm talking about, but that... Uh, that was a, a brokenness I had not been prepared for, I should say. So I worked through a grief workbook and was surprised that I didn't feel any better a few months later. Um, if anything, I actually felt worse. Uh, parenting and trying to participate in daily life just felt really hard and challenging. I remember looking forward to when I could sleep. So I would get up in the morning, it's like, I just got to make it to like one for a nap, and then get up at three, I just got to make it to, to bed. Um, there came a time when I guess I took matters in my own hands with this healing stuff. I say, I guess, because there's a 20-year span of my life that can only be described as a slow fade with my faith. Um, there's a Casting Crowns song called Slow Fade. 
And the chorus says, it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices are made, a price will be paid when you give yourself away. And then this big part, people never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. And that could describe my life overall in the next season. Um, we then moved back to Florida to here in Cape Coral, and I started working as a counselor for hospice, which is ironic for someone who can't face their own grief. <laughs> Why not help other people deal with their death? Um, but I definitely was no expert, but it was busy enough to give me time not to think, and I think that kind of became my goal. Um, I began eating fast food daily as I traveled to patients' homes in my car. Um, it was like rewarding myself for making it through dealing with other people's pain. Um, I gained weight. I got more depressed. I saw a psychiatrist who added more meds to my antidepressant. And each new med would sort of help for a week or two, and then probably when I saw him again in six weeks, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not good. And um, he would add another medication. <clears throat> I think at one point I was on seven psychiatric medications. Additionally, I began to feel like a total failure <clears throat> at parenting my very sensitive son, Caleb. Um, I'm just going to stop there and tell you that by the grace of God, this August I'll celebrate five years of sobriety. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Jesus for sure. I've had time to grow and heal. I've attended countless AA meetings. I received lots of therapy, listened for God's wisdom as I read scripture, and made Jesus my best friend. My biggest takeaway is that during this very bad season of my life, the lies at some point just became louder than the truth. And if I only rely on myself, the truth will not be found. I can think, I can have an opinion on something in the morning, and that night is totally different. So why would I rely on my own wisdom? I do not know. But I think that's pride, and that's just what we're prone to do. Like, I'm going to figure it out. Um, so the following lies took further root in my heart. You're a loser. You've made a big mess of your life. What a waste. Uh, you're huge and a total embarrassment to your son and husband. God might be real, but he must not care about you all that much. There must be something wrong with you. You'll never be enough, um, and there's no one who actually cares about you. You're a burden to your family. As these became my daily thoughts, I continued to try all my human ways to fix things. I went on fad diets, used amphetamines. Um, I tried several gym memberships, and I would go once or twice, and then I'd feel like a bigger failure. I read lots of self-help books. Um, I did pray, but I felt like God had decided to leave me. As what, and that's probably the biggest wound. <laughs> that's what hurt. Uh, my faith started losing ground. There were still, so I don't want to discredit it and say there were not still really good moments in my family and some good memories. Um, but my will to live and to keep trying was really fading quickly. Um, I was, in all reality, slowly dying, already of spirit, and body was going quickly behind. I began to numb myself with wine a few nights a week, but as it goes with alcohol, um, it took a little more to numb me every time. Started to add a little vodka into that to help. Um, and what a genius idea, I decided to try the fad diet again. <laughs> And um, this time, I followed the doctor's orders very loosely, um, took lots of diet pills. I'm surprised I did not have a stroke. Um, my relationships began to falter as I became more addicted and more in denial about what I was doing. My husband and son thought I was unreliable at best and were very confused by my behavior. Um, my moods were all over the place. And everything began to make me so angry, and I experienced rage about tiny things. Um, so in 2015, it became clear something had to change. I went off the diet meds, um, 
but I felt like I wasn't functioning at work. So I returned to the same psychiatrist who suggested ADHD meds. So then I went on those, but one wasn't really doing it. So then I did two, and <laughs> all this just to say, um, oh, and then on the ADHD meds, I would get so wound up, so at night I would take extra anxiety meds, and I was just a really hot mess. Okay. Unbeknownst to me, God was stepping in and coming for me in ways that I would not realize. We went um, with our church in February 2016 to Israel. Not only myself and Wes, but our son, Caleb, both our mothers, and my sister and brother-in-law. And God spoke to me that very first morning on the Sea of Galilee. Um, he showed me Peter, who was partially submerged in water, and I heard him say, you're Peter, and you're drowning because you took your focus off of Jesus. Then a week later, as I prayed at the Western Wall of the temple, I gave it all back to God and surrendered all that I could, all that I understood at that time. Um, and God said, I will rebuild your life as you trust me. Um, at the end of that trip, I just wanted to add, I ended up getting that exact scene he had shown me in a little sculpture. Um, and it was just kind of, I think he was trying to say to me, like, you're important. That lie is not true. I'm doing something. And that was really cool. Um, I had no idea what this rebuilding would look like, but surely it would be awesome. Well, it turns out that rebuilding, at first, looks more like a demolition of sorts. And then you begin sifting through the rubble and just trying to hold on to something. Um, I left my job after receiving a disciplinary write-off for not being productive, for being argumentative, and taking my trip to Israel when I was one day short of vacation. I was also fired by my psychiatrist who had been tagged by a pharmacy. And of course, my initial alcoholic thinking was really uh, a lot more in the martyr category than I would like to admit. It was like... Yeah, anyway, I think everybody knows that. That was one of the big lessons in recovery for me, is that um, the victim mentality doesn't work, and I had to kind of own that, and that, that's not very fun. But I can say that I did start to own that. Um, let's see. Okay, all of these actions caused the lies in my head to really take flight. I really might be the world's biggest loser. The shame was huge. Somehow I knew that God was still doing something, but I never imagined what it would involve. So I got into therapy on a regular basis. I don't know that it was because I thought it would help, but it did. Um, I began to go off the four psychiatric medications, and within a few months uh, became shocked as the real me kind of became of coherent mind and body. And I tried to wrap my head around all that I had done wrong in that time. Um, and I gave up alcohol in July and attended my first AA meeting in August of 2018. God quickly began teaching me through others, uh, even from the very first meeting, every day. And I began to recognize my lack of humility and pray daily for God's healing wisdom and humility. When I worked the steps with my sponsor, Alexis, it was actually a huge relief to come to recognize um, what a big part I had been of the problem. It was shocking, but then it was like, oh, okay, there's stuff I can change. Um, that increased a good measure of hope for me. And not only did God help me along the way, but he came near, and his presence was what I really, really needed. I came to realize that I'd put up walls around my heart, and I had to learn to let God penetrate those. It's still a challenge sometimes. I began to submit my life and my will. And step three actually has been the hardest uh, step for me because I think he made me aware of all the ways uh, that I don't actually submit. It, even if I say, not my will but yours, um, I continue to try to figure something out all day instead of uh, just go to him. So a member of my home group recently said, we have to remember to raise our white flag every single day. And for me, I've learned most times that when something's not going well or just that my spirit is troubled, and I'll be like, what? What's wrong? And then I'll realize, um, oh, I forgot to give that to God. 
or I've been trying to solve it myself. Um, sometimes it stems from my own human pride and my need to feel important or recognized, and sometimes it comes straight from God's enemy. Now, I don't really like to talk about he who shall not be named <laughs> is kind of what I would say, um, but it would be denying a character of the Bible who has spoken of clearly. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was subtle and more crafty than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say that you can't eat that fruit? So all my years in Sunday school, um, I had missed that word really. And I was reading um, lots of books that I've been suggested by my therapist. So this was one by Lisa Turkhurst. Um, But I'd miss that word, really. So it's not only that Satan suggested that Eve disobey and eat the one fruit, eat from that one tree that God had said not to. It's that he made her doubt God, and he made her doubt her understanding of God, and he made her doubt God's character. Um, And I feel like that could describe my 20-year really rough face. Um, I was confused about God's character, In my mind, it was, um, I was thinking, if he really loved you, would he let your son die? These are things that I've learned to just realize. Sometimes I really just don't know. Um, Romans 1.25 says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped created things rather than the creator. For me, when life got too hard, I let doubt soak up too much of my headspace. And I've learned to stop this from happening as often as possible. And the quicker, the better. Um, On that note, I just wanted to share one other quick healing that God kind of gave me. And that's, um, there's something called theophostic prayer that my therapist recommended I go to. And as... Um, You sort of journey with God and look at your pain. It's probably different for everyone, but that was where what we did. And God gave me a picture just of um, the day my son died and just showed Jesus actually holding me as I held my son. And I realized that that's the truth. (laughs) And so I was able to replace the lie with the truth. Um, In December 2017, a very intelligent Ivy League educated attorney named Rudy Giuliani stated as the defense for someone, (laughs) truth is a construct. I had to laugh because I know some attorneys and I am kind of amazed the stuff they come up with. (laughs) Because honestly, the one thing that is not a construct would be truth. That is like saying that facts and data are untrue. But as I thought about it, I realized that as a society, truth has become very hard to find. It's very hard to discern these days. And many people seem to think it can be found by secret research or a certain website. Uh, I'm thankful for my faith at these moments and thankful for God's word. I'm thankful for Jesus, who somehow 2,023 years ago knew to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he is honestly the only thing that makes sense to me a lot of days. And that's okay, because he does make sense. (laughs) Thank goodness. Um, I wanted to highlight, there were lots of worship songs that God's kind of shown me along the way about lies and truth, and I was like, oh, I see what happened, yeah. Um, But the best one is just a chorus. Um, So as I wrap up, This is a chorus from Tasha Layton's song. Um, A lot of you have probably heard it. And it says, look what you've done. Look what you've done to me. You spoke your truth into the lies I've let my heart believe. And that sums up my recovery journey. Um, And I have to say I'm grateful for addiction and AA because they brought me back to the heart of God, back to where it was. Um, my sponsor told me early on that someday I would be thankful. <laughs> and I was like, I do not know when that's going to happen. But I, I've gotten there, yeah. And she keeps saying that after five years, evidently things get really great. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes, yeah. 
Um, but I also want to say, if you're here tonight and those lies are speaking louder than the truth, keep pressing on. God is coming for you. Find a sponsor who can speak truth into those lies. There is healing and hope for all of us. And we just need to remember to raise our white flag and say, not my will, but yours be done. May we all continue to know it and accept it and claim it for one another. Thank you.